Welcome to the Eternal ROI Podcast, where we share the real stories of workplace transformation. And now, here are your hosts, Will Stewart and Chris Patton. Welcome to the Eternal ROI Podcast. Good to have everybody watching and listening along. I'm Will Stewart, joined as always by Chris Patton, CEO of His Way at Work. Hey, Chris. Will, how are you doing today? Fantastic. Man, I'm excited today. We are, uh, we've got a privilege to uh, talk with a gentleman. Uh, his name is Rich Stearns. Rich, if I were to go through his his resume, his pedigree, uh, we would just have to close at the end of that, <laughs> the episode, because there's yeah. so much that he's done, uh, so much that he continues to do to offer uh, basically wisdom from his life experience. So I'm excited. I've had a conversation separately with him about this uh, beforehand, and uh, I just think the, the audience is in for a treat. Yeah. So I'm excited a lot of well. wisdom here. Yeah, Looking that's great. To that. Welcome, Rich. Good to have you on the show. Hey, it's great to be with you guys. Yes, sir. Thanks for taking the time. For those who who may not be, uh, you know, know who you are and, and and may not be as familiar with your work, this is where you can brag on yourself a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your your work history and kind of uh, starting with kind of how your your kind of business history and then where you are today. Well, I've had uh, a topsy turvy kind of crazy career, and I'll just try to encapsulate it in a few words, but. Mm -hmm. Um, in college, I majored in neurobiology and animal behavior, of all things. Um, wow. And that didn't equip me much for the marketplace. So uh, I went on to get an MBA at the Wharton School of Business in Pennsylvania uh, with a focus on marketing. And then uh, when I got out, I, my first job was with Gillette in Boston. So my wife, my new wife and I moved to uh, Boston and lived there about 10 years. I only worked for Gillette for a couple of years. But then I got a job, uh, kind of a dream job. I applied to a want ad. Parker Brothers Games in mm. Salem, Massachusetts was looking for a marketing assistant. So uh, I left Gillette and went to Parker Brothers. And uh, I spent about nine years at Parker Brothers. And uh, about seven years in, I kind of rose through the ranks uh, and uh, very quickly and became uh, uh, as my wife called me, business boy. I became the CEO of Parker Brothers Games <laughs> when I was 33. Wow. And, uh, uh, and and so it was way over my head. You know, my vice presidents were all in their mid-50s, and here's this 33-year-old kid that's, you know, trying to be the CEO. So uh, I got thrown in over my head. And uh, a couple of years later, uh, the company uh, changed ownership, and they, they turned over the senior leadership, and I found myself out of work, which mm. in my own life story, that out of work uh, time became very significant spiritually between myself and the Lord. Uh, and then on the rebound, I took a job with the Franklin Mint, moved my family to the Philadelphia area, and less than a year later, got fired again. Uh, again, more spiritual uh, learning. And uh, uh, my wife said, whatever lesson God is trying to teach you, I hope you learn it quickly because <laughs> you, know, you need to get back to work. <clears throat> and after that, uh, so you can see the pattern, you know, this unbelievable success, like a rocket ship, and then down into the depths of despair, you know, mm -hmm. getting fired twice in, 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 the, in a one or two year period. Uh, but then in God's grace, I was offered a job at Lenox China, the fine China crystal maker. And uh, I spent 11 years there and I, I, I kind of rose from division president to group president to COO and then to CEO of Lenox. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would die or retire in that job because I loved the company and, you know, was, uh, it was I, God had kind of restored me, uh, my career. Mm -hmm. I felt like Job a little bit. I got restored in the end. Uh, but then in 1998, I got one of these uh, headhunter phone calls that changed my life and it was... A recruiter looking for the new president of World Vision US, uh, the big Christian ministry that helps the poor mm -hmm. around the world. And that's a long story, but uh, I quit my job at Lenox, you know, took a huge pay cut, packed up my five kids and my family and moved to Seattle where the uh, the sun never shines and the Mariners <laughs> rarely win. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I spent the next 20 years uh, logging 3 million air miles, traveling the world uh, with World Vision, and really taking my business and leadership skills and applying it to a, a Christian ministry setting. Uh, best 20 years of my life. And uh, just three years ago, I retired. And uh, I think the reason for this podcast is uh, in my retirement, I wrote 
a new book called Lead Like It Matters to God. Mm-hmm. And uh, kind of my le- my leadership lessons as a Christian that had spent about 45 years in various uh, leadership roles. Mm-hmm. So that's the, the thimble full. <laughs> like yeah. I said. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of wisdom. Lots of wisdom here. So that's a roller coaster, and uh, it seems like it's, it's, there's ups and downs in it all. What was the through your first uh, kind of interaction with God, and, and kind of when when did you decide to become a disciple of Jesus, and and when was that mm-hmm. kind of that, that that first step that you took took toward God? Yeah, so you know, I grew up in a kind of a well a dysfunctional home, and maybe most of us grew up in a dysfunctional home, but I <laughs> had a particularly dysfunctional one. Um, my father was an alcoholic with an eighth grade education. My mother never finished high school. They divorced when I was 10 years old. And mm. uh, my father declared bankruptcy and the bank foreclosed on our house and basically mm. evicted us. Uh, so it was pretty rocky uh, childhood. Um, and so as a result of that, I became very self-reliant. You know, I became one of these young kids that you know, I often made my own dinner. I was a latchkey kid. You know, I, I, I kind of had to make my own way uh, when it came time for college. Neither one of my parents had either the money or the knowledge to guide me in college choices. And uh, mm-hmm. so I had to figure it out all myself. Right. And I went, went I applied to Cornell. I only applied to one school, uh, Cornell University, which was 50 miles away mm-hmm. from where I lived. And uh, so I was on my own. And what that resulted in is I became... Uh, I, I had been raised Roman Catholic uh, nominally, but I became an atheist in college. I just, I was a science major and I just, I thought people who needed God, you know, were, I didn't need a crutch. I, I thought religion was a crutch. And uh, so I was this uh, card carrying atheist by the time I was a senior in college. And wow. until I met my, uh, my future wife, who was a Christian and uh, very involved with Campus Crusade and kind of an unusual attraction of opposites. Uh, But within a year after meeting her uh, and after reading about 50 books by C.S. Lewis and John Stott and various Christian authors, uh, I literally knelt down in my my dorm room at the Wharton School and uh, committed my life to the Lord. I don't know if anybody's ever done that at the Wharton School of Business, but uh, <laughs> but, but I they worship a different God there. Yeah, it's yeah, probably but, a small uh, club either way. <laughs> yeah, it might be a small club, but um, <laughs> and after that, after that commitment, um, I just never looked back, and uh, it was an amazing. Uh, the Lord, uh, you know, there's a quote I can't remember who said it, but you know, the the nature of faith is first you leap and then you grow wings. Mm. And I took that sure. leap trusting the Lord. And uh, then in his grace, he helped me to grow wings, spiritual wings. And, you know, I never looked back and never had a doubt after that. That's awesome. How long have you guys been married now? We have been married 46 and a half years. So, uh, you know, my fraternity brothers at Cornell gave it about 18 months. They thought it would last about 18 <laughs> months <laughs> because they knew me as this kind of crazy atheist guy, yep. you know, and. But it, it's really been, uh, my wife has really been a, a full partner and she's most of the reason that I became what I became, you know, That's she and she and the Lord double teamed on me. Not fair, but good, <laughs> good combo. Yeah. Right? So as a, yeah. as a new Christian, you know, your mentors sounds like early on were, were authors and, and, and great mm-hmm. theologians. Um, but then once you got, you're, you're, you're saved, you're, you're, you're now on a new path and you're going into business now. And did you have mentors kind of walking with you and, and, and kind of helping you uh, on, on your journey, especially as it relates to business? Or did you kind of figure that out on your own? Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, the, the pastor who married us, uh, we got married in Ithaca, New York by a, a pastor who had a ministry to students there. And uh, he was very influential in my early, uh, you know, faith steps and faith walk. Um, he's still alive. He's 90, uh, I think 91 years old now. And uh, uh, just an amazing guy that over the years I've stayed in touch with and, you know, touched base with him many, many times. But I had the benefit of going to some really good churches, you know, and uh, so my, my mentorship was mostly through the churches I attended, uh, the pastors who built into my life, uh, the other Christians that surrounded uh, me. And my wife and I have been in a couple's Bible study every single year of our 46 years of marriage, you know, mm-hmm. so we, we have been with other couples who were like-minded and 
uh, we've been very faithful with churches, but um, we we attended Park Street Church in Boston, one of the great old missionary churches in America, and uh, got really well discipled there. And then uh, you know, subsequent churches were were that as well. But in terms of business, you know, I, a lot of it was trying to figure it out myself, but just trying to. Well, I think I always realized that you know my witness for Christ was very important in the workplace. That you know if I was going to have an influence. Uh, it would be the my character and the way I conducted myself in business, and so I, I tried to be that person, that winsome Christian that might, uh, you know, provide a positive witness for the the, the Christian faith. Mm. That's, that's good. So you talked about some some life lessons that God taught you along the way. Um, I know you you said thirty three. You're you're this uh, you know you achieved a just a great position in this company, um, and then you know kind of the roller coaster goes down. Then afterwards, like, what were some of the lessons yeah. that God was teaching you uh, along those along the, your journey? Yeah, well, um, you know I write about this in the book, but um, success we li- we live in a success saturated culture, right? And success is kind of an intoxicating drug. Mm-hmm. So for a young guy that had grown up very poor in a family with little or no education to become CEO of a nationally known company at a young age was a very heady, intoxicating kind of experience. Right. Yeah. And, uh, if I'm, uh, as I say in the book, uh, if I'm honest with myself, my, my sales were filled with a lot of my own wind at that point in my life. <laughs> uh, I felt like everything I touched turned to gold and Hey, this, this business stuff is going to be easy for me. And, uh, mm. um, and I, I literally feel like uh, when I look back on, you know, sometimes we wonder why do why do bad things happen to good people? You know, why why did I get fired? I mean, when I when I first uh, uh, experienced that, I you know, like many people, would I cried out to the Lord, like why why did you do? You know, what ha- why why? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I thought this would be a great opportunity to be a greater witness, and it was to me, it was like the coach was watching me and said, I got to take this guy out of the game for a while, put him on the bench. I got to, mm. I got to do a little work with, with Rich in his wow. head and his motivation. And, mm. and then, you know, to, to be fired again, less than a year later, mm. um, you know, God really wanted me to understand, I think that, uh, it was not about my career. It was not about me. It was not about worldly success. It was about being faithful. Right. And, uh, and putting him first in my life, which I tried to do. I thought I was doing, but in retrospect, uh, I had really gotten caught up in the whole, you know, uh, game of business and success and bigger bonuses and bigger salaries and more power and more acclaim. And, uh, you know, one of the, it's, it's interesting. One of the things that came back to me was something from my Catholic catechism classes when I was five years old, and there was a question there, why did God make me? Uh, it was from one of the catechisms. And uh, and the answer that we had to memorize was uh, to know him, love him, and serve him in this world. That's why God made me. And in that very simple truth, it was like a an aha moment for me that I could know, love, and serve God unemployed. I could do it in unemployment. I could do it as a taxi driver. If, you know, if the business thing didn't work out and I end up driving a taxi, hey, I did that, you know, to work my way through college. Um, I could know, love and serve God as a taxi driver. Mm -hmm. If God was gracious enough to let me have another significant leadership role, then my goal, my, my, my number one objective would be to know, love and serve God in that place. And when I finally got the job offer from Lennox, I literally started every day with that prayer, I said, Lord, I am not here to sell more dishes. I am not here to make more money. I am here to know, love, and serve you in this place. Help me do that today. That's great. And uh, that was a way of keeping my head straight and, and, and understanding why I was there. I was not there. Lennox as a company, it was a job, it was work, it was important work for a lot of people who work there. But my role was to uh, be a witness for Christ in that workplace. That's good. Rich, I'm curious, you take the two different times, two different periods after losing your job, both at Parker Brothers and then at Franklin Mint. If you can, in your mind and heart, go back to that 
to the depth of that period, what are some doubts, fears? What were some of the emotions and the the uh, challenges in your day to day that you can recount and with now with new perspective, kind of give somebody that may be in that same situation today or recently gone through it, give them some perspective, some advice. Yeah. So losing a job is devastating for most people, maybe for all people, uh, because it's a very personal uh, affront, right? You, you, something about you has failed. You, you, yeah. you weren't, you weren't right for that job. You, there's something you did or didn't do that uh, you have to kind of own up to and say, you know, what happened? You know, what, what was it that, that happened to me? And, and our identity is often so caught up in our title, right? Our job, yes. our title. The first question at a party is, well, what do you do? Where yeah. do you work? And um, mm-hmm. um, so when that's taken away from you very abruptly, you, you, you cast about for your identity, like, well, who am I now? You know, I'm just mm-hmm. an unemployed guy, you know, that, uh, used to be somebody, right? You know, I used to be yeah. somebody. <clears throat> and of course, what I learned through that process is my number one identity is is as a follower of Christ, right? So that's my identity, um, not the title on my business card, not the size of my salary or where I fit on the organization chart. And once we get that straight, that that's our identity, that's who we are, and this other thing is what we do. Uh, it, it's the activities that we undertake, you know, day to day. Um, but we do it as ambassadors for Christ. And uh, as you know, from looking at my book, the if I have a life verse in scripture, it's 2 Corinthians 5.20, which goes mm-hmm. like this. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God is making his appeal through us. So I, I, that's a wow verse for me. We are Christ's ambassadors. And what do ambassadors do? I mean, when, when an ambassador for a country is sent to another country, they are sent to represent the character, the values, and the priorities of the one who sent them. Mm-hmm. And so if we're ambassadors for Christ, and it doesn't matter if you're a cab driver or a CEO, um, you're there, wherever you are, you are there to represent the values, the truth, the priorities and the character of the one who sent you, who is Jesus Christ, and you're his ambassador. And that's your job one. That should be the title on your business card when you when you think about that's it. Good. And your secondary job is whatever your 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 work title is. And uh, so the question becomes, how can I be an effective ambassador for Christ wherever I work and live? That's excellent. So that that goes into my next question, which is taking the vast majority of your time, your career, uh, at least up until you took the job with World Vision, the majority of your career was not spent in charge. Right? Right. The majority of your career, you were now in several cases, you were working your way up quickly, but you were Mm -hmm. working in environments that were not Christian ministries. They were not churches. They were businesses. They were corporate businesses. And therefore, Mm -hmm. you didn't walk in every day to hymns and and praise music and (laughs) and opportunities to sit around the the water cooler and and share stories of your mission work over the weekend. These are businesses. So give some, some advice, some wisdom to those today that are listening that are not running their own company. They work for somebody else. They work in an environment that may not be anti-Christian necessarily, but is certainly Mm -hmm. probably neutral at best. And uh, how do they, day to day, live out as an ambassador of Christ, as you've so well Mm -hmm. described it, and have an impact on the people around them, uh, and yet do so without getting fired for it or getting sued (laughs) for it or whatever whatever the case may be? What what would you say to that group? Well, you know, Chris, the thrust of my book, uh, the subtitle of the book is Values Driven Leadership in a Success Driven World. And um, mm-hmm. wherever you work, uh, I, I'm pretty certain that the goal of that organization is to be successful, um, <clears throat> whether it's a school or a hospital or a corporation or a ministry. You know, we want to be successful. We want to achieve our goals and this, that and the other thing. And and what happens often in these environments is 
success becomes the primary goal instead of, so our success, our success as leaders or workers becomes our primary goal and it trumps uh, leadership uh, or character. It trumps our character, right? So sometimes we compromise our character uh, in order to achieve successful outcomes for ourselves and for uh, the organization we work for. <clears throat> and I think the Lord wants us to get those things reversed, that uh, you know, our character and our faithfulness is first. And yeah, we might be successful, but success is not the goal. Faithfulness is the goal. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> as you know, Chris, uh, I tell the story in the introduction to my book of Mother Teresa when she was once asked the question, Mother, don't you feel like you've been a, a failure? Um, you, you have this tiny little ministry to the poor in Calcutta, but you're in an ocean of poverty yeah. and suffering, and you can't possibly succeed in your mission. And her answer to, it was a U.S. senator, she said, my dear senator, God did not call me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, what a wonderful way to explain the role of a Christian in any kind of work or leadership capacity that God is not calling you to be successful. He's calling you to be faithful. And if you're faithful, and I talk in my book about the 17 leadership qualities that should characterize a Christian leader, or you could say a Christian anywhere, a Christian in the workplace, a Christian mm -hmm. in their community, a Christian in their school system. And those characteristics, things like humility, integrity, excellence, uh, um, you know, a, a sense of humor, uh, uh, an, an ability to listen, uh, being an encouragement to other people, those things comprise your character and your character really comprises your witness in that place. So <clears throat> the advice, you know, I give to people wherever they are in the organization is be that person of character. Be the person that everyone in the office trusts. Be the one that they come to when they've got a difficult thing going on in their personal life and they need a shoulder to cry on. Uh, be that trustworthy person that they can confide in. Uh, be an encourager to people in difficult times uh, in your workplace. If you are that person, uh, you will affect the entire culture of the, the department or the place in which you work and, and here's, the, here's the payoff in, in many ways is I don't know any company that doesn't want to hire people like that. That's you know, right, that's right. Uh, if you've ever run a business or if you have employees underneath you, whatever level you are, don't you want people that have character and integrity, uh, people that are faithful and honest and truthful and, and hardworking and uh, uh, team players committed? Uh, Com businesses, companies, organizations want people like that because a person of character is more likely to achieve success in their chosen profession. Right. And when you put that first, the success is more likely. When you chase the success at the expense of those characteristics, those character values, that's when you really are headed for trouble. Yeah. So yeah, you know, I, I just saw a quote online. In fact, I'm giving a speech uh, in a couple of weeks and I've titled it, When You Lose Your Why, You Lose Your Way. Mm -hmm. And it's a quote from a woman named Gail Hyatt. And I think for a Christian, if, if, if your why is I'm here to serve and represent Jesus Christ as his ambassador, you'll never lose your way. Mm -hmm. But if your why becomes, you know, I need to get that marketing director position or I need to get that next promotion or, you know, if I achieve this, this, and this, I'll make a lot of money. Um, if that becomes your why, uh, eventually you will lose your way because you've got your priorities mixed up. Um, and, and uh, you know, God is, when we, when we stand before the Lord, he is not going to give us a recitation of all of the accomplishments we had on That's earth. Right. He's not going to say, wow, that business, that real estate deal you did in 1994. Oh, perfect. Wow. You know, that was perfect. That was amazing. He's not going to care about any of those things, you know, earnings per share, uh, salary growth, title on your business card. The only thing the Lord is going to be pleased with is what kind of ambassador were you? Uh, did you represent me with character, with integrity, uh, with love and care for the, your coworkers and the people around you? And if you did that, kind of like Mother Teresa, 
that's what I called you to do. I didn't call you to be successful. I called you to be faithful. And uh, so if we cling to that, uh, we will, in w- many ways, keep ourselves out of trouble, you know, and uh, we, we will, we will, we'll, we don't want to risk this thing called success becoming idolatrous in our life and uh, leading us, you know, in a direction that we'll someday regret. Yeah. And that's such, that's so counter to the world system, you know, um, because when we think that if we're on mission with God and, and, and living for God and doing, you know, that we're not going to be successful, but the true success comes from that. And, and, you know, success is preached to be a lot of different things, you know, by, by a lot of different, uh, people, but, you know, it could some, for, for many of us, it's, it boils down to just fulfillment and, and, and fulfilling mm-hmm. that we we're doing the task that we're supposed to do that we've been called to do. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it requires daily renewing your mind, I would say. Right. Um, cause you, you mentioned about, uh, having that, that mantra of, of, you know, God's called you to know, love and serve him is that, mm-hmm. you know, staying in the word, um, kind of reciting those, those, the kind of that, that sentence that God's given you, is that kind of the, the key to uh, someone who is, is kind of steeped in the world system to, to keep their mind, and their heart renewed? How would, how would they keep themselves like on, on mission and, and just having that right focus? You know, one of the powerful parables in the Bible is about the, the man who built his house on the rock instead of the man who built his house on the sand. And, uh, because it talks about, you know, the storms will come, the winds will blow, the waters will rise. And that's very true metaphorically of our lives, right? Uh, during our lives, during our careers, the storms will blow, the waters will rise, the winds will, you know, will sweep upon us. We will have really difficult times. <clears throat> but if we built our house on the rock, you know, we will stand, we will stand. And, um, uh, you know, the first chapter in my book is entitled Surrender. And it really starts with that very first thing that we're called to do as we believe in Jesus Christ, to surrender our lives. And, and you know, there's no asterisk on those passages, you know, not my will, but thy will, you know, uh, you know, uh, he who gives his life, you know, will gain his life, you know. Uh, okay. There's no asterisk that says, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but, you know, in my business, it's a little different because, you know, you don't understand the pressures I'm under. You know, I work at Amazon. It's a dog eat dog world. I've got to deliver profits. I've got to deliver results. Uh, so I'm going to exclude that from the part of my life that I surrender. Hmm. And I think it starts for all of us is we have to surrender our lives, our careers, and just basically say, Lord, not my will, but thy will. This is, this is I don't want this to be about me. I want it to be about how I can serve you. And if we keep that straight in our lives, if we, if we keep that priority, right, um, we will, uh, hear those words at the end of our lives. Well done, good and faithful servant, faithful servant. You've run the good race. You've fought the good fight. You've been faithful. And, um, you know, and I think that's, uh, that's just the, the critical aspect of surrendering our lives and saying, you know, when I went to World Vision, uh, it was a big surrender moment because God was really kind of calling my bluff. To, All right. You know, I think you've learned some of the lessons I taught you. I, I you know, I had you've been uh, you've been fired twice and we did some work together. <laughs> but here's the real test. Are, are you really surrendered to me? Because going to World Vision was terrifying for me. It was financially it was a 75 percent pay cut. And I had wow. five little kids to put through college. Um but professionally, uh, it was becoming the CEO of an organization that I knew nothing about. Mm. Remember, I'd been selling fine China, and now I'm in charge of an organization that works in 100 countries of the world with 40,000 employees helping the mm. poor. And I knew nothing about global poverty. I'd never been to Africa. Uh, it's a Christian organization. I had no theological degree or background. And it was an organization where we had to raise $3 million a day, 365 days a year, and I had never done any fundraising. So (laughs) you talk about scary. I mean, it was terrifying for me and probably even more terrifying for the staff at World Vision when they read (laughs) the announcement of who their new leader was going to be. But, you know, that caused me, I was being obedient, right? Lord, you called me here. I've obeyed. It took 
every ounce of will in my body to say yes to this. But boy, we're in trouble now because I don't know what to do next. And I feel helpless. And I felt in that moment that the Lord was saying, good, I have you exactly where I want you. Totally dependent on me, totally helpless without me. Now, watch and see what I'll do with your obedience. And he did. He, God was faithful. And over the next six or seven years, I think the revenue at World Vision tripled. We lowered our overheads by a third, became more efficient. Um, we tackled some of the most difficult humanitarian crises in the world. We tackled the AIDS pandemic. I mean, but it was all because I was willing to surrender and let God, you know, let go and let God. Uh, and God works through us in those ways. Uh, he, he can accomplish things that we can't, uh, but we have to be submitted and surrendered. That sounds so simple, <laughs> but man, it is not. really, <laughs> it is simple, but it is not easy. No. And you've said it and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but you know, it's easy to surrender parts. It's yeah. extremely difficult to surrender all. And that mm -hmm. all is, is really the key to the door that we're talking about here. When we surrender all, then it's only on him, and we acknowledge that. Frankly, it's always only on him. We just don't acknowledge it. But we surrender right. and acknowledge that what he can do with that is exponentially greater than anything he can do with double your effort <laughs> yeah. If right. without the surrender, right? So yeah. that's just such a big deal. Let me ask you this. It just pops in my head as, as you and your wife are uh, likely – discussing, because I can't imagine you just pop this on or, hey, guess what, babe, we're moving across the country. Uh, as you guys are discussing <laughs> this move from Linux to World Vision, what were some of the, the talking points there? How was What was her mindset around this surrender and stepping out? Well, I was kind of a simpering coward, you know, in this whole process. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I, I really was. And uh, it's, it's like, I don't want to do this. This is risky. This is crazy. You know, going back to my childhood financial insecurity, the notion of, you know, I had made it in corporate America. I was a CEO of a prestigious company making some nice money. And uh, I had this phenomenal poster child, successful Christian life, right? Uh, we had bought our dream house, which was a, you know, 200 year old farmhouse on five acres. Mm -hmm. We were raising our kids there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I walked into church, you know, people would say that guy's the CEO of, of, of Lennox China, right? You know, the, the kind of the, the, the notoriety that you get, the, the perks and the privileges. And here's God saying, you know, I want you to give it all up. I want you to go in and quit that job. I want you to take a big pay cut. I want you to, you know, leave that community and pull your family. You know, our kids were in a great Christian school. Pull your family, uh, kids out of that school, move to Seattle. And so I was kind of hoping that my wife would put her foot down, you know, that she'd mm -hmm. say over my dead body, we're going to pull my kids out of school, sell my dream house. Sorry, God, and, she wouldn't go along with it. We're out. Yeah. You know, like Adam said, it's that woman God gave me. It's that woman <laughs> you gave me. I, I would have gone, Lord. I, I really would have. But, mm. but, you know, her answer to me when I finally, and it really looked like they were actually going to offer me this job and what do I do? She basically said, well, it's pretty easy. We need to be where God wants us to be. That's the only safe place for our family. If God's mm -hmm. calling you to World Vision, we go. We pack up the kids and we go because that's the only safe place for us to be is in the center of God's will. And I was like, really? You, you, you're, you're not going to say, no, we can't pull our kids out. No, I don't want to do that. No, um, you know, I have, we have a life here. We have friends here. We, you know, but, uh, it's interesting, you know, I mentioned meeting her in college. Uh, we met on a blind date. And uh, when I asked her what she wanted to do when she graduated, she said, oh, I'm going to help the poor. You know, God has always put it on my heart that I'm going to help the poor. I'm going to become an attorney and I'm going to help the poor with their legal problems. And, uh, and she said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to become a CEO and make a lot of money. And she said, that's pathetic. You know, that's, that's a pathetic <laughs> life goal. <clears throat> that's, there's no meaning or purpose in that. And uh, so she did become an attorney and go to work helping the poor in the Boston area um, with their legal problems. But you see, the Lord knew that 25 years later, 
I would need a partner who was passionate about helping the poor. Yes. And so when she saw me called to World Vision, it was like a no brainer for her. Like, of course we will go. Of course we want to do that. I've wanted to do that all my life, you know. And uh, so the Lord often gives us the right, uh, the right life partner to to help us, you know, do the things He wants us to do. And she became kind of my sidekick. She traveled with me every year, uh, visiting World Vision projects. She spoke to women's groups. She did. We co-authored a book together. Um, she was, you know, an amazing partner. That's awesome. It's amazing how God moves even before we know what he's doing and and why he's doing what he does. Uh, We talk about surrender and, you know, you're the first time around when you're 33 CEO, if you'd had that call, you know, from World Vision to let's go, you know, be the CEO there. Do you think and that's before God kind of worked in your heart and all that? Do you think you'd be likely to to have done it or did, did it take that? kind of those downhills and, and all those trials to, to kind of get you to a place where you're willing to, to surrender to him. Yeah. I, I think it took, it took a lot of work, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. back when I, when I said that my wife, you know, after I'd been at world vision for less than a year, I, I realized how much I loved this new calling and how exhilarating it was and wonderful. And I said to her, why didn't I do this? when I was in my twenties and she said, cause you weren't ready. She said, the Lord had a lot of work. To, the Lord had a lot of work to do with you. I was 47 when I, so he, he had to do like 25 years worth of work with me mm. to get me ready to do something like that. And I think there was a lot of truth to it that I was, I was too young, too full of myself, too full of my own agenda. Um, and the Lord in his graciousness really said, uh, on this journey we have together, you know, I have some, some business to do with you. I've got some work to do with you and I'm, I'm preparing you through these things for something you don't know about yet, but I'm preparing you for, uh, something. And, um, and of course, isn't that the way it is with our lives? Often when we look back at our lives, we can see all of the milepost markers where God did some work in our lives, uh, and prepared us for something that we did not even know was coming. And, and uh, that's what I saw. Yeah. He's so faithful. He sees value in us and he, he's willing and, and wants to invest in us. And uh, that's just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, we'd be remiss to not talk about World Vision a little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about the organization, why it's important, why should, people should support it and in the, in the good that it's doing across the globe. Mm. Well, you know, um, everything we read in Scripture talks about how close to the heart of God are the poor, right? It's throughout the Old Testament. Uh, We're to welcome the stranger and the refugee. Uh, We're to care for the widow and the orphan in their distress. We're to feed the hungry. You know, the passage in Matthew 25, which is just so amazing. Uh, You know, I I often say Matthew 25 is uh, is the final exam. uh, And it's the judgment day where... uh, Jesus stands before the sheep and the goats, and we're told he separates the sheep from the goats. And there's only one question on that final exam. It says, what did you do for the least of these? Remember, he says, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. Um, I was sick and you, you visited me. I was a stranger, you know, and you welcomed me. I was in prison and you came to me. And he said, whatever you've done to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you've done it to me. Mm. So his, his, almost his parting words uh, among his final words to his disciples were uh, go out into the world and take care of the vulnerable, take care of the weak, the sick, the stranger, the, the, the naked, the, the hungry uh, and the thirsty. And, um, and so it, it's, it's such an important part of our faith. You know, I wrote a book, 10, 11 years ago called The Hole in Our Gospel, where I really unpack what the Bible says about our responsibility for the poor. So World Vision, I mean, if, if you want to summarize the total instructions God gave to his church before he left, he said two things. He gave us the great commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves, you know, to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves, and the great commission to make disciples in all nations, teaching them everything I have taught you. And um, so World Vision, basically, that's our mission statement at World Vision, to uh, take the gospel to the ends of the world and to do it uh, with a methodology of just loving people, loving our neighbors. You're a Syrian refugee and you're a Muslim. We love you. 
We mm-hmm. care about you. We care about your family. Um, you know, you're fleeing from violence in Ethiopia right now. World Vision loves you. We care about you. We're going to we're here for you. We'll walk with you through this. <clears throat> and it's it's just the most basic elemental expression of the Christian faith. It, it's just love in action, the love of Christ, you know, m- with human flesh, uh, with flesh on it. And uh, it's just such important work. Um, and of course, we live in the United States in a very affluent bubble. And um, uh, we don't realize that there's 600 million people that literally don't have access to clean water within a 30 minute walk of their home. Wow. Um, we don't realize there are 800 million that go to bed hungry every night. There are mm. 80 million refugees in the world that have had to flee their homes and leave everything behind. And we have the resources, the know-how, the ability to do something for these people. And uh, if we if we want to hear those words of Matthew 25, well done, you know, welcome to the rest I prepared for you. You, When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. We would be wise to uh, heed uh, the Lord's commandment to care for the least of these, not just around the world, but in our own communities and in right. our country. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a powerful organization. It does so much good. If uh, What was the big lesson as you were now CEO of World Vision? What was the big thing? Was there was there a big lesson that that God taught you as you as you kind of went uh, along in this journey, the, the new chapter of your life? What was that n- next chapter for you in, in your personal development? Well, um, I've already talked about how it, w- it was a uh, a revelatory moment in the notion that. I needed to trust God. It was probably my my final surrender, if you will, mm. that I, all right, Lord, I have I have no recourse now. I, I am so unqualified for this job. I have no recourse but to completely lean on you for the outcome here, right? Uh, mm. Trust you for the results. <clears throat> and I think, isn't that the way we are, that we like to rely on ourselves uh, in a crisis uh, or in a situation and God is often our last resort. Well, all right, I wasn't able to do it. I wasn't able to, whatever, accomplish this, accomplish that, deal with the disease I have. And our last resort is, Lord, help me, <laughs> help me yeah. to do it. So I think, you know, I learned that lesson that you've got to go right to God first, you know, say, Lord, not my will, but thy will. I'm going to trust you for the outcome. Help me to be faithful uh, in this situation and use me in any way you, you will. So I think that's uh, that was the first lesson that I learned is is how important it is to really trust God for the outcome, even when it looks like things aren't going very well for us. You know that mm-hmm. uh, you know I got fired twice; things weren't going very well for me. But in retrospect, uh, if I had trusted God through those things, I would have seen that He had you know a plan and a future for me that yeah. I didn't even know about. Um, but you know, the other thing is, uh, and maybe this came from being part of a Christian organization is uh, I talk about this in my book that uh, if you're managing a team or you're just working on a team of people, and I don't care where you work, Microsoft or General Motors or, or a real estate company, think about this. The people around you are precious to God and made in his own image, and they are uniquely gifted and talented doesn't matter if they're believers or not believers. They could be irritating coworkers that you prefer to avoid, but they have unique giftedness and talents that God has given them. And so if you look at the people around you uh, as put there by God with unique perspectives and gifts, you actually get to draw from the divine well of giftedness and human giftedness. And if you start to look at your employees that way, I, I use the metaphor of it's like an orchestra conductor. You know, if, if, if you look at the people around you as they have beautiful music inside of them, mm-hmm. and maybe I can be the conductor that brings out that beautiful music and, and, and brings out their giftedness in a way where they can realize their own God-given potential in the workplace. And I talk about how that's really the goal of every manager is to say, it's not about me and my success and my next promotion. It's about the people God has entrusted to my care. How can I help them realize their God-given gifts in a way 
where they achieve uh, personal growth and and success, if we, if we can call it that. And if I've done that, I've been a great leader. I've been a great manager. And guess what? If you do that, you create such a positive culture in your yeah. team, your organization, that people flourish in that kind of culture, that kind of support that when they get it from the boss. And, uh, and when that happens, teams are successful. They, they, they're more successful in accomplishing uh, their, their goals as a team. And if your team is more successful, you're probably gonna be more successful too. Mm-hmm. Not because you made success your goal, but because you made faithfulness and care for your sure. coworkers your goal. And uh, you end up getting success anyways. Um, in most cases. Yeah, mm, that's, that's powerful. Good. What's a piece of advice that you uh, wish you would have received 10 years earlier? You know, I talk about this in the book that it's, it's the power of encouragement. You know, and we've all had performance reviews where, you know, you go in and you go, oh, you kind of dread it. I got my performance yeah. review today and <clears throat> the boss is going to tell me all the things he, he wish I was that I'm not, you know, uh, <laughs> And uh, all the things I did wrong, all the things I can do better, you know, all of my shortcomings are going to be on display. And what I've learned, and I wish I'd known this earlier in my career, um, encouragement is such a powerful motivator of people. So you're in a meeting with, let's say you're the boss and you're in the meeting with, you don't even have to be the boss, but you're in a meeting and somebody makes a contribution. If you say, hey, that is a great idea, you know, thank you for, you know, articulating that you know, that's added real value to our conversation. Let's talk about Dave's idea. Let's talk about Mary's idea. Or you pull somebody aside after the meeting and say, you know, hey, you you were awesome in that meeting. I mean, you you just really changed the whole direction and the outcome because of your contributions. You know, way to go. Um, we all know how it feels when we get that pat on the back or that little bit of encouragement from somebody that matters. Uh, and when you're the boss, it's magnified 10 times when you say that to one of your subordinates. Mm -hmm. And especially if you say it in front of all of their coworkers and peers, right? You know, you, you kind of elevate them and, and if you have to criticize them, uh, wait till after the meeting, do it privately, you know, and say, Hey, look, you know, I noticed something in that meeting that I need to point out and I didn't want to say it in front of everybody else. Uh, but even when you, give that criticism, you, you can accompany it with a little bit of sugar that makes the medicine go down and say, mm-hmm. you are so gifted in, in, in areas A, B, and C. And, uh, you know, you're such a critical member of our team. Uh, I just want you to be aware of this tendency, which I saw in this meeting and, and you can, you know, you can do even better. Uh, so I think, uh, encouragement is a very powerful motivator. We kind of understand it innately with our children, right? When you raise kids, Right. Uh, we encourage and reward every positive thing they do, you know, from their first scribble with a crayon to their <laughs> their first tentative step onto a soccer field. You know, hey, you were great today. You really hustled out there today. You know, you did a great job today, Johnny or Mary. And uh, encouragement is just like a it's like a secret weapon for leaders uh, that will motivate your team to they jump off a cliff for you if you're a boss that understands encouragement. That's good. That's fantastic. What's a uh, top resource, like a book that you'd recommend that people read? Well, you know, you have maybe, one in mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, lead, lead like it matters to God, yeah. um, which by the way, uh, you can almost read that book like a devotional because uh, as I said, there's 17 chapters on 17 values. And if you're if you want to read the chapter on integrity, you can just read that chapter. If you want to read the chapter on forgiveness because you've got an issue at work, you can read that. There's a whole chapter on love. What does it mean to love your coworkers? Um, if you're having trouble loving one of them, you might read that chapter. And uh, But, you know, there's another book I mention um, in my book, and it's an obscure book. It's called The Wisdom of Crowds. And uh, I write about it in the chapter on listening, how important it is for a leader to listen uh, to the voices around them and pay attention Be- again, because these are people gifted by God. And there's this little book called the wisdom of crowds, which talks about how better decisions uh, are almost always made because more people participate in that decision-making. So if you're surrounded by people made in the image of God and you invite their opinions into the decision-making process in a very positive way, uh, 
you will make better decisions. And it's actually been proven scientifically. And this book goes through a lot of the research on, you know, why is it that a group of people with diverse backgrounds will often come up with a much better uh, outcome than a single solo performer who might be brilliant, but um, they don't have the benefit of the input of uh, other people. Uh, so it's called The Wisdom of Crowds. I think the author is James Surowiecki, but that's a good resource. Interesting. Yeah, I'm going to check that one out. We'll put uh, links to that as well as to uh, to your book um, uh, in the show notes so people can click on that. Or if you just want to Google it, just go to Amazon. It, it's easy to easy to find and easy to buy. Uh, last question. You've been so uh, just great to chat with and I appreciate your time. Appreciate you just uh, just being super generous and open um, and incredibly helpful, really inspiring. But the last question is, uh, what's the big takeaway from the day? What do you think people who have been listening, what should they leave knowing? You know, there's, there's a, an aha moment I had fairly late in my career that maybe I'll just share it uh, w with the listeners uh, uh, to this podcast. And it's this, that uh, what God is doing through you, it involves you, but it doesn't depend on you. Now, why is that good news for Christian leaders? What God is doing through you involves you, but it doesn't depend on you. Well, you can look throughout scripture. Um, David slayed Goliath, right? A 16-year-old teenage boy when all of the armies of Israel were terrified of Goliath, no one would challenge him. David said, I'll do it. You know, I'll take, I'll take him on because I trust God. And uh, now David was involved in slaying Goliath, but it didn't depend on David. You know, it didn't depend on him. God honored his faithfulness, his trust, his willingness to obey uh, and delivered uh, Goliath. And you can look at almost every leader in scripture. Look at Moses. Moses was a whimpering, simpering, I don't want to go. I don't want to confront Pharaoh. Yeah. I don't want to do it. God sends somebody else to do it. God got angry with Moses. <laughs> Moses finally said, okay, all right, I guess I have no choice. I'll do it. And then did, did Moses bring the plagues on Egypt? Did Moses part the Red Sea? Did Moses provide manna in the wilderness? No. What God was doing through Moses, it involved him. It involved his obedience, but it did not depend on him. And maybe the greatest example is Peter in the New Testament. Now, if you'd gotten Peter's resume applying for the job of leading the new first century church, uh, you know, into the second century, you would have thrown it in the wastebasket. Peter was totally unqualified, totally uneducated, a fisherman with an impulsivity disorder who always had a habit of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Uh, he even betrayed the Lord three times, and yet God used Peter to change the world, not because of Peter's ability, but because of Peter's availability and his faithfulness. We're told when Peter was called from his fishing nets, it said immediately he left his nets. Immediately he went to follow Jesus. No questions asked. You see, Peter made himself available. Peter surrendered to the Lord. And the Lord said, I can work with that. So the reason that's a good news for you as a leader is that uh, if you surrender, if you trust God in that way, um, the outcomes, you can trust him for the outcomes. It, it doesn't depend on you. You're involved with what God is doing through you, but it doesn't depend on you. And, and so that's a certain amount of freedom. And when I came to World Vision and realized that, hey, this depends on God, not me. And uh, so I I don't have to go to bed guilty every night because there are hungry children that we couldn't feed because uh, I know God loves those children more than I do and that God will use me if I make myself available to him. That's so good. that's it's my parting deal. thought. Yeah. Big deal. <laughs> that's, a, that's incredible. Uh, it's a great, a great way to end it. It's yeah. uh, such a, a, a challenging uh, uh, episode here. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us and, and just mm -hmm. share all the wisdom that you have. I encourage everyone who's listening and watching, make sure you uh, check out uh, the book and, and get it. Um, it. It'll it'll help change your life and, and help refine some things in your life. So thanks so much. I appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with us. Rich, thank you. Thanks, guys. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to another episode of Eternal ROI. If you like what you heard, we would love for you to take a moment and leave us a review and share an episode with somebody you know. If you are inspired to begin bringing the power of God's love into your workplace, take a moment and check out our free assessment at hwaw.com. 
It'll only take you a few moments. It'll give you a snapshot of what your company looks like and maybe some ways to move forward. Just click on the link in the show notes and we'll see you next time.